Hello, welcome to the CT Pro Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We have a very special guest today, William Fauché. And if you like what you hear today, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us at becomecgpro.com. Um, William, who is joining us here today, is probably many of you will know him from his YouTube channel. William is a prolific uh, visual effects artist coming from the, the games world through into the visual effects world and uh, become a, a force in the virtual production world as well. Um, William's worked on lots of cool things like the Watchmen the HBO series back in the visual effects time and now has a one of the most popular YouTube channels uh, covering Unreal Engine and virtual production. Um, William, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to, great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you too. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So um, yeah, feel free to, to fill in any gaps there. I gave you a, a quick intro, but if there's anything else. That... Yeah. So at the moment, I mean, like you put it so eloquently, I'm doing mostly YouTube as well right now. And I've also been doing, making some courses for Epic Games. Um, you know, some of their, uh, mostly about the, like, the movie render cube tutorials that I've made on their Unreal Online Learning platform. Uh, so I've been doing courses for Epic and, all, and right now I'm also a mentor at CG Spectrum. Uh, where I'm teaching part time, uh, I've made some courses for them as well. So some world building in Unreal uh, courses I made for them as well. So uh, so that's been a, a really fun. It's been a fun experience. It's been it's always very rewarding to teach students and such. So it's uh, it can be you know frustrating sometimes, but also very rewarding. It's very time consuming, and it's cool to see the progression of people you know from start to finish. So it's always a, a really fun thing to do. I've always enjoyed it, and I'm as you are very well aware. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we definitely have that in common. Yeah, being, mm -hmm. being teachers in this subject is, uh, yeah, it's a real honor to get to see people's work and see people's progressions and watch them go it's on. Really really cool it's really It really is. To see, especially when you have a student who, you know, you weren't too totally sure about at the start, and then, you know, through the sheer will of hard work, um, they managed to, to pull through and make some amazing stuff that, you know, you, you know, it catches you by surprise. You're like, whoa, and you know, I didn't expect that. That's amazing. And so it, it's really satisfying to see that come to fruition there. So it's been, and it also keeps you on your toes just because sometimes student, you know, as you're well aware, students will ask you questions that you're like, wait, I, I don't, I don't actually know that. Um, you know, yeah. it, it kind of gives you a different way of thinking, different philosophy on things. So, uh, it's, it's, it really does keep you on your toes and, you know, you, it makes, you need to make sure that you stay up to date on the newest stuff as well, because it's very, you know, after you're in the industry for a long time, it's very easy to become complacent and, and just, you know, rely on your history to, uh, on your past experience. But, you know, you got to stay up to date because things are constantly changing so fast. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, it's been, it's been good. It's been a good time. That's great. Yeah. I, I will say that with, with, um, knowledge, that you really know it when you have to teach someone else like that's yeah. that's the point which you actually know something like there's been so many things that i've taught where i've been teaching it and gone oh i understand that now just as i'm saying it to you <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes yeah. having to simplify things in a more digestible format it really is like oh yeah you know what like yeah okay it, it clicks now like actually writing it down and repeating and kind of even rehearsing it's like oh yeah that makes that actually makes more sense so yeah, it, it's a good, uh, it's a good experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Keep, it keeps you honest. And as you said, it, it um, the pace of change feels like it's picked up as well. I think it, it probably has, <clears throat> whether it's perception or not. It, I think the pace of innovation is, has kicked into another, another gear, particularly around this new real time renaissance. It has, it really has. And because I feel like games for a long time were kind of where Kind of like I feel like games and VFX are kind of ten years apart. Where you know, games again to the point where VFX was like ten years before that, and um, yeah. so but now like those two worlds are really slow, are rapidly converging, and it, it's really cool to see. Um, it's cool to see games kind of stepping up very quickly, and you know VFX is progressing as well. It, it always is, but it's I feel like it's more. It's not quite going as fast as games is right now. Or when I say games, I mean real time. Um, so cause like 10 years ago, I don't think we would have considered using unreal to render anything, to be honest. Like, I don't even, you couldn't really render anything in unreal. I mean, you would, you could like screen record and stuff, but you're rendering it for pre-rendered final pixel stuff was not really a thing 
10 years ago in Unreal. So, because then UE4 yep. only came out, what, 2014? 2014? 20, right. Something like that. So, it, it's, you know, it's new. It, it, sorry, it, it's not that old, to be honest, like less than a decade. So, um, things have come a very long way since the first versions of UE4. And now with UE5, pretty much here. I mean, the early access is here. The final, the 5.0 is not here yet, but it's at our doorstep. It's it, it's imminent. So, yeah, usable. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing looking back and over my career and thinking about what, what um, car commercial, for example, that I worked on 15 years ago that I was leading. That was, we were putting renders on the farm that. I, that were saying they were going to be a week before they came back off the farm oh, and making my producer off. cry. <laughs> <laughs> I love well, like some of the kids you know, today. If you're under panels, then you're yeah. kind of screwed. We had to, yeah, we had to do all the all the optimization work that you do in real time, but for offline, just to make the renders yeah. go faster and take yeah. passes out and just do render half res and upscale, do all the, all the same things that are now coming into real time. But and the renders that were coming off in a week off a big render farm looked not as good as as the matrix demo and, and oh, just like sure. looking at it going, ah, that's it's so crazy we've come to come to this point where you can actually get the frame back instantly and it looks yeah. better it's it, it's crazy i mean i don't think it's it's not easier there's definitely a, a, a fair amount of extra work that goes into real-time stuff like just because you know a lot I've, I've noticed a lot of studios they kind of expect unreal to be a faster arnold so to speak but as we all know, it's not a faster Arnold. It's, it, you know, there are, it has to take shortcuts somewhere. And, you know, a lot of times, like, you kind of need to make up for that time that you save by either spending way more time on assets than you normally would. Like, things like displacement don't exist. I mean, they exist in Unreal, but they're kind of half-baked. So, you know, I don't think it's any faster to develop uh, for real time, at least in its current state. Things might change, you know, with Nanite and, uh, and Lumen moving forward, but it's still a lot of work to get things you know looking amazing in real time yeah it's absolutely i think it's i think it's done amazing things in terms of getting it out to more people and having more people interested in it and more yeah. people capable of creating imagery but it but it sort of also hidden the fact that the art is still crucial and what you put into it is crucial there's a lot more that you can leverage that from the marketplace and that kind of stuff but if you want to make your yeah. own stuff the same old skills we've been using for a long time. That's definitely a good point. Like this, we can find, I think the barrier of entry now is much lower than it used to be as well, because now yeah. anyone can just kind of download a pack on the marketplace or even, I mean, make a scan alone is phenomenal. Like that thing is crazy how good that is now. Uh, just such a, a fleshed out library that, you know, anyone who with zero experience in 3D can just go ahead and get started. And, you know, within a, a day, get a, pretty darn good looking render which is just it's crazy to me it's, it's completely fascinating um but of course like that doesn't compensate for a lack of fundamental understanding of 3d right um yeah i think that that's kind of we're getting to the point where a lot of people don't really i mean you can tell right away when someone doesn't really know 3d that well um just because as the moment like this is actually something i've noticed with my students is you'll notice right away where they just the moment they have any kind of hurdle whether you need to change the uvs or there's a, no, a mesh normals issue they're stumped they have no idea what's going on and uh so things are easier but the, you still need to have a solid understanding of 3d um to to, to use to get into the real-time world i think yeah absolutely and I th yeah i think you put it really well there it's it's, it's lowered the bar so that people can actually get in can actually make imagery and we see people all the time who have got no experience at all coming in and, and doing things that are useful to them straight away but yeah, yeah if you, once you start getting into it and you want to change something or create something of your own then people start kind of dipping back into the, the the world that we've been in for a while and visual effects and starting to want to learn another dcc and some other tools to kind of supplement yeah. that yeah, hundred yeah. percent. It's uh, so you know, I think it's good. I I've noticed a few students think they they're they're good artists. They have the good eye for things, but you know they're missing some core foundational three D skills that are just really really important to have. So even you yeah. still know how you know know how to UV things. You need to know how to you know because the moment that you need to make anything that's not currently existing that you can you can't find in the marketplace. Well, 
you know, they're stumped. They don't know what to do, right? So, um, then you yeah. can, I mean, you can buy stuff on Turbo Squid, but at some point, sometimes you need to make your own assets, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, speaking of that, no, why don't you uh, tell us about how you got into all of this in the first place? What, what, what were some of your um, inspirations for getting into the industry and kind of how, how did you, how did you get in in the first place? What was your beginning story? It started off, I would say, a long time ago. I don't remember the specific year, but uh, I was a kid. I must have been like 12 or 13 or 14. And I had the, I was at the bookstore with my mom and there were the introduction to Maya 4.5 book. And I saw that, you know, I was into video games. But like, I wanted, like, I want yeah. to make video games when I'm older. And, you know, this was maybe the mid 2000s or something. And at the time, like you couldn't really, I mean, there wasn't, people didn't really know that you could make games for a living. Like it was just kind of this obscure thing. And uh, so I really wanted that book and my mom, you know, begrudgingly got it for me because it was really expensive. And so, you know, that's where I learned what a vertex was. That's where I learned how polygons were. There, you know, I, there was like a trial for Maya in it. So I nearly fried my parents' computer just getting Maya installed. And so that was kind of my introduction to 3D. And then that kind of took the side burner for a few years. And um, <clears throat> so then, you know, fast forward a few years and you would, I was finishing high school and I, wasn't a, I had finished high school. I was starting college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was kind of kind of lost and I was the, I had a few ideas of what I wanted to do career wise, but it wasn't anything decisive. And so uh, lo and behold, I found a school that specialized in 3D art in my hometown. And so that like right away, I'm like, okay, I want to do that. And, but this at the same time, this was a private school, for-profit school. Um, and it was kind of the, what you would expect. It was the kind of school that just hired its former students. And so it wasn't a great school to begin with. And, um, so I did learn the fundamental, like the core, very, very basics of 3D, but I would, I prefer to say that I'm mostly self-taught just because everything I know now is stuff I've learned on sites like Polycount. Like Polycount was really big in the day. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with it, but the Polycount forum yeah. were a, an amazing learning experience. Like this was like, you know, mid to late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2009, anywhere between 2008 and 2012 or something was an amazing place to learn. Like that was where I learned most of what I know today, at least when it comes to game art. And so without that community um, of, you, the best part of that community was that there was a collection, a, a very large group of veterans of the games industry. And these were people who were working at AAA studios and they would just, you know, you could have like your work in progress threads and just post what you're working on and people would critique the crap out of it. I mean, they were absolutely brutal in their criticism. <laughs> like it was constructive criticism. It was nothing personal, but they were rough. And they were like, okay, this looks like crap because of X, Y, Z. And so that's where it really weeded out the people who are very thin skinned and couldn't take constructive feedback. And those, those people left, but the people who did, who applied that constructive criticism to their work really like grew as an artist. And it was really cool to see that progression. And that was where I realized that you know, constructive criticism is the best possible way to learn and grow and accepting the criticism and realizing that it's not a personal attack against you. Um, it, it's more about how you can improve your work from someone who A, had more experience than you, had the better eye for, than you do, and can kind of see the problems you're gonna face down the line, which is where having a mentor or a teacher whose experience is really, really handy to have because, you know, it happens with my own students, I'll see them working on something. I'm like, I can see that in two weeks, they're going to run into X, Y, Z issue. And so that's where having that, the, the Polygon community was an amazing learning experience. They had lots of sticky threads and like, Hey, this is how you do X, Y, Z, because there was no, I mean, YouTube wasn't really big yet at that point. Gumroad didn't exist either. So there was no documentation at all. You kind of had to figure it out on your own. And that's where like that forum was inc an incredible learning experience. So, um, and the, the people would like take your screenshots of your work. They would do paint overs and stuff. And like, no one does that anymore. And this was absolutely awesome. So like, it's a shame that it, it's probably kind of still around, but I don't I think it's a shell of what it used to be. So, uh, yeah, it's a different, it's a very different, uh, environment now than it used to be. There's more 
there's a wealth of knowledge now. There's tutorials for everything. So, it, like I said, I think the barrier of entry is a little bit easier now than it used to be, primarily because of accessibility to knowledge. You've got amazing people sharing really good knowledge out there nowadays, and uh, which just w didn't exist back then. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how it came to be, and though I was lucky because right place, right time. When I finished that one year of that one year program, uh, that was not a very good school. I got lucky and got a job in the industry, in the games industry, working in Montreal, a small indie studio. Um, and that's I was there for like five or six years. So that was my um, most of my life was, was spent, you know, working in games or most of my career, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, you know went traveling for a while, took a break. Um, I thought I was going to be done with the industry. I was fed up with all the crunch and like, ah, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And after several months away, that ZBrush itch kind of came back. Like, oh, I kind of want to, I want to get paid to sculpt stuff now, right? So uh, yeah. it kind of went back to back into the industry. I went back working at the same place actually for another year or two, and then uh, I figured like, okay, I think I've done. I've been around the block in games. I kind of want to go into VFX now, and I want to do film, right? Like, I was tired of making collision boxes and stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to make like <laughs> really good looking art. So that's when I joined the Storm Studios in Norway. And uh, that was like an amazing learning experience as well, because we had people there who had worked on like The Hobbit, they had people who had worked at, at Weta for a long time, uh, people working at DD in, um, in LA. So yeah, in DD. And um, they were just an amazing learning experience. So really, really skilled people who were basically my mentors. They taught me everything I know about VFX. And just being in dailies meetings every single day, Again, that was kind of took me back to to segue back to like the Polycount forum, where it was just awesome to have someone critiquing your work on a daily basis, and someone who's actually very skilled and points out all the flaws and just like pixel peeps, like you know how it is in daily, like people will just like zoom into like four hundred percent, like oh this this group of pixels here kind of fix that, you know that sub pixel detail is not good, and like. So yeah. that was an amazing experience. Like I really loved it. I really really loved it. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, and that's kind of how it came to be. So that's where I got my, all my VFX experience. And then, you know, COVID happened and then YouTube channels happened and, uh, it all kind of, the past two years have been really, really crazy. So, yeah. I, I agree. Well, that's really cool to hear. No, I think it's, we have a lot of different kinds of listeners. Um, some people are already in the industry, some people who are not, and I think for people who are looking to get into the industry it's really helpful to hear how it happened for you because I know for certainly for me it was pretty difficult getting in initially and um, mm -hmm. so very similar kinds of things in, in yeah. looking for instruction I, I also remember that on the not unreal the Maya 4 book mm -hmm. <laughs> the internet didn't exist no, particularly at that point so I still have the 3ds yeah. max bible it's like this monster of a thing it's so big and uh, that's how you had to learn. You had to read page and like, oh, like what's this random setting to do this X, Y, Z? And you'd like flip through the book and like, okay, there it is. And yeah. and of course, then, like a version would change and that button doesn't exist anymore. And like, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So it was, uh, but yeah, I got really lucky. Like again, right place, right time getting into VFX because the main reason I got the job in VFX to begin with is because uh, Storm Studios was it was the v they're a VFX studio. They're, they're they're like one of the biggest VFX studios in Norway, but they were actively working on an Unreal based project, and that's kind of where I kind of came in because I'd been working with Unreal for the past six, seven, eight years, and um, you know it would kind of then it, the stars kind of aligned, right? So I kind of slipped into the VFX industry that way without any prior VFX experience, and it was, it was just a a learning experience from there. So once your foot is in the door, you're kind of set to go. Cool. Yeah, it's um, so it was the Unreal that was the uh, the glue that kind of it was it was yeah. You I was thinking, it's interesting. It, it, this was at a time because I it, I almost went the the Unity route because yeah back in two thousand eight Unity and Unreal were very on par like they were I mean they were close and then there was CryEngine in there as well and those, those CryEngine yeah. Unity and Unreal like those three were very like neck and neck. Um, but I think the main reason that most environment artists that like, that's what I was going for. I was trying to be an environment artist and most environment artists use unreal just because it was way more user-friendly 
it would, more artist friendly sorry i should say um it would just easier to get act, have access to your material nodes and like make complex materials and stuff it would just way easier to use for that very reason so um <clears throat> Yeah, I think a Unity didn't, at the time didn't really have that artist friendliness. You needed a programmer to make your materials, or you needed third-party plugins to make your own materials and stuff, right? As you're yeah. well aware. So we've we've had this conversation before, but yeah. So uh, <laughs> Unreal. So as, as you say, <clears throat> excuse me. As you say, Unreal was the glue. Yeah. Right. That's uh, interesting to go tra transitioning between industries. Sometimes can be uh, challenging, and actually, from the Lion King was lots of games people coming into virtual production i guess which right. was a very very new word we weren't even really using the word at, at the was, time it was the same thing that we had where we had vfx artists suddenly doing some real-time stuff and they were just completely stumped because mm, the workflow was completely different and this was yeah. before in night there was no you know there was no uh indirect lighting had to be faked entirely and so people coming in with like oh yeah just a slap displacement on everything right and like no no that's not yeah, quite how it works not really <laughs> no. so i mean tell a after the effects artist you know five or six years ago what normal map is there's like what's a normal map right so, yeah well, it's, it's yeah. interesting culturally as well because two very different cultures coming together yeah. as well as the art yeah and so the tools uh, and the it definitely a learning experience for for those vfx people yeah for sure I, I want to ask you, um, you know, going going back to your kind of beginning story again, just for a second, because you you've been a really avid um, photographer, and I saw recently you put a video out about yeah. photography and about its influence yeah. on your work. And I I thought that was really interesting, and I, I resonated with that because I was kind of I was a computer scientist getting into right. this, but photography was my kind of art art side trying to get mm -hmm. into something um to do with computer graphics and it really really helped me as yeah. well so it, it really um resonated with me hearing you talk about that um i know that's a, a real passion of yours and that seems like it's helped helped you a lot um 100 percent it's yeah uh, can you can you say anything I would, I about really would be sitting here today in front of you if it were for that camera like right behind me right there it's right uh, <laughs> Like it's it's been such an influential part of my entire career. At first, it was just you know a way to get my butt outside, and uh, it was nice to you know you know just do something different and not be in front of the computer. And then it's only in hindsight that I realized like oh like everything I've learned from photography has like absolutely made my work better in every conceivable way. Uh, but sorry, I cut you off. You were about to say something. Oh no, I was just going to say no. I'd love to hear how it's affected your work and that continues to because I think. It seems like you're still very avid uh, practicing photography. No, I, say, I, I wish, I mean, you know, real life happens and, uh, you know, I haven't had time to shoot all that much, but yes, I, I, have, I love taking photos still for sure. And uh, it, it, it's going to be with me until the day I die. Um, it's one of those things where it's just, it's so satisfying. And like, I'm also a camera nerd. So I just love holding like advanced pieces of tech in my hands. It's just so satisfying. Um, and I, I, tend, I have a nasty tendency to really, you know, nitpick and pixel peep and like, oh, like the sharpness of this lens is so good. And, you know, focus on things that ultimately don't really matter. And that's actually something that a lot of people do. They focus on things like the, like, bo like the, uh, the, the bokeh, the depth of field quality, right? Like you'll pay thousands of dollars so that the out of focus parts of your images look better, which is just, it's weird, right? Um, yeah. But you know, that, that's how it is. And it's just, it's part of the passion, right? So it just, uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it absolutely makes your work better. It it just it makes you focus. It makes you pay attention to things. It, you notice things you otherwise would never have noticed. The texture, lighting, or you know, I, composition is the obvious one, but it's also the 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 not so obvious one. The not just understanding how a camera works because when we're doing stuff in three D, we're working with cameras, and real cameras and three D cameras are the same thing. Like you still have to understand how framing works and how a camera functions and what exposure like exposure is such an arbitrary concept in in 3d because it doesn't you know you can control the lights as much as you want yeah um, but you also focus on lighting and understanding that how light works how it bounces how a larger light source will soften shadows and that sort of thing like these are all things that i never even would have thought about if i hadn't been to photography right so, yeah that's really interesting yeah it's i i had a similar experience back in the day at university and i was getting into photography it was in the camera club and mm. it was all film and we were actually using the dark room 
and having to go in and process our photos and the amount of kind of consciousness that you need around that when you when you've you've spent half an hour just being able to see one image like that that kind of amount of thinking about what you're doing yeah really forces you to make good choices not not have to not just be able to click anywhere you want and look sift through a thousand pictures where you when, when you get home to yeah. pick the good one but like really thinking about it i think that's one thing i love about photography is thinking whilst you're looking through the lens before mm -hmm. before you make that decision that I love I love that about the old the old world because you really really have to think. So every time you press click, you spend money basically. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. And you have to be it really just having to think about it really makes your work stand out. And you kind of have to really pick and choose. Like, oh, if I wait five minutes, maybe the light will get better, right? And you just like you have to be patient. And uh, but at the same time, on the other on the other side of the coin, you also have the the fact that we can spray and pray means we can take more risks. We can experiment yeah. more, see what works and what doesn't work. And so like, oh, I'm wondering, you know, if, if I expose this way, will it be better or cooler? And when you go back home to check your photos, you're like, oh, what I thought would be cool turned out to look like total garbage. And, yep. uh, and, or, and the other way around, sometimes some of my best photos are actually turned out to be snapshots, like the ones I, I didn't even think about. I'm just like, oh, meh. take a picture. And next thing I know, like, oh, this is, this is a banger of a photo. Um, okay. And meanwhile, the photo where I actually like carefully set up the tripod and, you know, got everything right and perfectly framed. And that was like, ah, yeah, it's not the, the best photo. So it, I like digital because you can experiment more and try new things. And, uh, it, you also learn faster because having the yep. immediate feedback on the back of your screen, right? Like it tells you like, oh, I completely messed up my exposure. Why? But with a film camera, if you messed up your exposure, I don't remember the settings I use. You have to, yeah, you have to have to write it down if you were consciously yeah. trying to learn. And then who's that? Who's out there doing that in the field? Like exactly. writing all the lens settings down. Yeah. So it's uh, so there's there, you know pros and cons. Pros and both. cons. Like, yeah, I, I've enjoyed shooting film as well. It just uh, it's it is a tedious process. Oh, now I wouldn't I wouldn't do it now for sure. No. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. you've got as long as they, hey, I mean, if that's what you enjoy doing, I all the more power to you, right? It's uh, it's yeah. all about it's all about the passion, right? So people who say like, oh, film looks so much better, and like, well, I mean, we can emulate film like pretty darn well with digital nowadays, but I think as long as you're excited about whatever camera you're shooting, that's what's going to get you taking more photos. Whereas if you're, you know, if you just have your phone. You're not going to be very excited about going out to shoot with your phone, right? Like I'm sure my iPhone can take better pictures than an old, like I don't know, 1950s yeah. film camera. But again, this is the classic case of like even though the pictures are better, you're not necessarily going to take better photos. So it's it's all a matter of what gets you excited and gets you outside, and you know where the camera takes you is wh where what is important here. That's awesome. So, yeah. 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 The fact it's actually taking you somewhere in the real world as well, where exactly. you spend far too much time in the, in the virtual world. <laughs> it's good exactly. to get outside. Yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. It's really, really great to talk about that. I think it's the fundamentals of mm -hmm. where it's at really, you know, we, all the tools that are uh, coming out, they've changed tremendously over my career in visual effects and, and continue and it's just speeding up now. So I, th I think going back to that, fundamentals the understanding of what makes good imagery is yeah absolutely key for sure yeah um so moving into um f between visual effects and well games and into visual effects and mm -hmm. and virtual production um how how has it helped you um kind of jumping around between industries like that in terms of coming coming to where we are today and, and yeah. where all of this stuff's coming together I mean, I think having a background in games really helped me um, kind of because my whole goal, the reason I think the reason I think my YouTube channel took off is because I was helping. It was, you know, again, right place, right time where it was at a period where a lot of VFX artists are starting to learn Unreal. And, you know, there's no real translation for like VFX terms into game. Could be, for example, five years ago, UDIMs didn't exist. That was not a games thing. That was purely a film VFX thing. And so, like, people are wondering, like, hey, how do we get, like, UDIMs in Unreal? Like, until recently, it wasn't really doable. So, uh, so that was actually my first YouTube video, like, hey, how to get UDIMs in Unreal. And so, you know, it, uh, so I'm having worked in both industries, I'm able to kind of, you know, translate, for lack of a better word, a lot of those um, design philosophies uh, from, one to, from one industry to another. 
and um, <clears throat> yeah. So I think that that would really help, very very helpful, especially like in real time. You know, we it, it's all games oriented, at least for now. And so until someone else comes along and makes another kind of engine, um, Unreal's kind of here to stay. And so Unreal has, by na its nature, it's a very games-oriented design philosophy. So having a game background helped me with that, for sure. Amazing. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting going through the process of using Unity to make movies and then um, Unreal coming in and really, really taking it by the reins and, and becoming the best tool out there. Um, yeah. I know we've, we've got one or two questions coming in sure. from the audience. Yeah, um, uh, one which relate relates to that. Um, somebody's asking about uh, Unity's acquisition of Weta Digital yes. um, and saying, should, should we have a plan to switch to Unity in the corner of our minds or does Unreal cover everything for the future? That's a kind of crystal ball type question, I know, but... Um, yeah. That's definitely, yeah, I mean, it's it's, honestly, the question is, like, I don't know. We don't really know. I mean, yes, I think the fact that Unity has acquired some of those tools is amazing. I think that's really, really cool because, A, until, I mean, hopefully they make those tools accessible to the public, whether through a, a paid app or for free or whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact that we'll have access to those Weta tools is amazing because previously Weta was, well, they, they did their own thing. And you, they were just, you can never really try those tools out. And so now that we can, it's exciting. Whether that's going to happen or not, whether we will have access to them or not, remains to be seen. Um, I wouldn't, I think it's a bit too early to say like, hey, maybe we should switch to Unity. I think you should use the tool that is, that, the tool that makes the most sense for you to use right now, right? So don't yep. think about, don't try to, to plan for the unforeseeable. Um, until you actually have a need to switch, right? So don't switch for the just for the sake of switching. Switch if it makes sense. Yeah, that's a, a great answer. I think I would absolutely agree with that. It's it, we we can't predict where it's going to go. And no. uh, having, having used Unity on Lion King and Jungle Book, then mm. switching to Unreal Five, um, I used Unreal before that as well. But you no, know, Unity was the choice on those movies. It was fairly straightforward once you're in a pressure cooker, especially to yeah. pick those skills up if you need to really quickly. It's, there's a lot of the, I think going back to the fundamentals, really, you know, the fundamentals right. apply across every single tool. Yeah. The, the, the tool might be different, menus in different places, but even the concepts amongst game engines, they yeah. all borrow from each other. Exactly. It, it's like the whole 3DS Mac versus Maya kerfuffle. Like it, it doesn't really matter. Like as long as I can model my stuff in there, that, that's all all that matters. They're like, oh, should I switch to Blender? Like, well, switch to Blender if it makes sense. If it makes your work faster, great. Otherwise, like, don't switch just for the sake of switching, just to be into the, the whole trendy thing. Um, yeah. If you're if you're capable of and you're fast at working in Maya, stick with Maya. It just, there's no need. So it, again, it all depends on what you need to do and how fast you need to do it. And if a tool makes that your job easier and faster, sure. Yeah. That's a, the right way around to think about it. What's the mm -hmm. what's the problem and how do you solve it? You can exactly. solve it already with something you use. Although I will confess, I'm I'm a 20 year Maya user currently uh, in the process of <laughs> switching to Blender, but I'm still faster in Maya, and it's like oh, it's really sure. frustrating. I mean, no one actually likes Maya. Like I think they're everyone kind of hates it. Deep <laughs> down, to this ball of rage, but you kind of stick with it because of I don't know pure Stockholm syndrome or something, but. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, familiarity, you know, I'm, I know that I'm yeah, just like, exactly. I can, I don't even have to look at the screen almost to be able to use my, exactly. I really have to think with a new tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really uh, difficult, I think, for a lot of people talking about <clears throat> what to learn and how and when. Um, so another question that's come in, somebody's asking about which software packages you would recommend uh for film and virtual production as a generalist i mean a either unreal or unity or whatever actual render you're going to be using that's kind of goes without saying um and then ha on having an understanding of any other dcc for actual like modeling or creation of assets right so having a like, solid understanding of 3d that can be bl blender is a great one because it's free so it's like the barrier of entry is, is very low maya is really expensive even the maya indie version is not too bad but it's still not free so blender i think it's a great way to learn and it doesn't really matter if you use maya or blender or 3ds max or whatever it 
as long as you're good at one, spitting out models is fine. What matters most, it's such a studio dependent thing. Like some studios are very 3ds Max focused. Some are very Maya focused. So I think, you know, try to aim for, if you do the job that you really want, a position you really want at a certain studio you want to work for, find out what they use and use that. And yep. uh, I think Blender's kind of a safe bet just because, hey, it, it, you can't really go wrong with it. It's free and you got nothing to lose. So, uh, yeah. So, but, you know, it, for film VP of the generalist, yeah, I think that's pretty much all you need, to be honest. I can't, uh, can you think of something else? Yeah, no, I, I um, my favorite three these days are uh, Unreal, Blender, and Houdini. Yeah, I think those are. Just, Houdini had a, a learning curve, like a, a steep learning curve for for some people. At least from yeah. my experience, of course. I mean, like as you so eloquently put before the the podcast, like you know, you're trying to explain it in a no BS way to make it more digestible for for newcomers, right? But I can understand why a node based system is a little bit daunting for new artists. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I love that little cartoon image out there of the learning curve for Houdini, which is like yeah. a slope, then it goes into a cliff, and then it overhangs and someone's hanging themselves off the edge of the overhang. Yeah, it's tough. It's very, very difficult to learn, but the power, the power of it is unrivaled. Insane. You know, it's absolutely it's insane. so, if I had so to good. Over, like, I would try to introduce more Houdini into my workflow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's there's a lifetime of learning in, in CG. That for there's forever, no... forever learning. You're never, you're never done, which is both inspiring and depressing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Even like, you know, 15 years in the industry, you're like, oh, I still have more to learn. Like, I just after dinner, spend another hour or two just watching tutorials, and it never yeah. ends. But I mean, I like it. I, I like, I find that exciting, and so it's, it's cool to pick up new things, and it's, it's always inspiring to see new tools pop up that make things that were previously almost impossible suddenly sudden very doable like a perfect example is when dynamesh came out with zbrush like that blew my mind um that was a game changer um now with nanite like that's also a game changer just throw in a 20 million polygon mesh and handles it like a champ in real time it's like that's just meanwhile like maya can't even have that dent of a mesh in the viewport unless before crashing right so it's yeah. insane absolutely insane how things are changing now so it's uh, it's an exciting time to be uh, to be in the industry i agree yeah I, I, haven't, I haven't seen this much innovation in the whole time that i've been in it really you know it was very exciting on the way in 15 years ago um but the last few years really i think have been the most exciting part of it because because of that there's so much change and particularly coming into real the use of real time it seems like real time is poking into almost every corner of mm -hmm. visual effects, filmmaking, way more industry. accessible, so much yeah. more accessible. Like I, the main reason I did my the whole uh, tribute to Halo video, my whole Master Chief video in, in in Unreal, is because I wanted to do it in Arnold. But you know, I was this was during COVID, and I was at right. home. I didn't have access to a render farm, and I'm working on like a it's it's a decent computer, but it's nothing fancy. I would say it's like a a mid range gaming PC. I'm like I can't render that out in Arnold or do a whole cinematic like that. That's gonna take forever. So I think real time just makes it way more accessible to the average person to just make cool art. You know, that's I wouldn't it's not gonna replace Arnold, not yet, but it's close enough for most people. So uh, so that's the exciting thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really amazing to be able to see it as like an equivalent of digital photography, I guess, so you can see the result in real time. Yeah. So for doing look development and the actual development of the piece, not having to wait for a week for your photos to get developed or for the yeah. thing to come back off the farm. <laughs> Very good analogy. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, it's really, I, I render times when, as soon as they started seeing, I was working in Unreal for offline rendering as well. No, just, just purely because of the render time so it wasn't running in real time because they loaded it up with just grass everywhere and all the things that you know make it slow down tons of transparency yeah. whatever it's like the but, but, but still i was getting six frames a second which is an incredible uh, so much better than hours per frame <laughs> six frames per second <laughs> For sure. and like, i don't miss rendering like in the middle of the night you get this email it's like oh like this farm node crash like oh crap why <laughs> yeah no more of that is done and people will never know 
what it's like to be a, a render wrangler sitting there oh. in, in a studio. <laughs> Fortunately, probably. Oh, a lot yeah, of people cut their teeth there. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, another question that's come in about uh, talking about Unreal 5 and the progression into this idea that we don't have to optimize as much anymore. Um, do you, what uh, somebody's asking about, do you see displacement still being a thing in Unreal 5 or is Tessellation just going to take care of it? A hundred percent, because displacement, having like texture driven displacement is so handy. It's so useful where you can just add a little tile level texture that even just for noise or um, when I'm doing look development, I tend to work very procedurally. So like in Arnold, like all pretty much 90% of all my shader work is like fractals and like remapping of fractals and like triplanar fractal noises and stuff to kind of build some texture variation and such. And displacement is, is so handy to just drive displacement through um, through maps and tile and procedurals and stuff like that. So yes, it's awesome that we can, you know, just bring our zebra skull directly into Unreal, but I don't think that it's always very convenient to have to have like the geo baked in, so to speak. Sometimes I yeah. want to have a tileable texture that I can change the tiling on the fly and then displace that instead of having to somehow displace it in ZBrush or something or in Blender or whatever, bake that down, then export the OBJ or the FBX into Unreal and it takes forever to import really heavy meshes into UE5. Like, yeah. yeah, Nanite can handle it fine, but you still need to get that FBX or the OBJ into the engine. And sometimes with really dense meshes, that can take like anywhere between five minutes and half an hour. So it's just, it's not very convenient. I would rather have like a typical uh, texture driven subdivision based displacement in Unreal. And then it, for Nanite, then we could bake that down. If we could bake it down in Unreal, that would be great. Um, but yeah. we can't you can do that sort of. There are some modeling tools where you can um, drive displacement through a texture and then bake the displacement, um, but it's still very bare bones. It's like it's 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 there. The support is very limited now, so hope that's probably going to get better. Um, but I don't think it's going to replace a displacement baked workflow, a based workflow. Sorry, um, I think I'm, I'm I'm sure you're aware as well. Like it, displacement is so handy to have yeah. uh, more ways than one. So I don't think it's going to replace a displacement based workflow, but um, it is cool that we can just bring in dense meshes now. I think it's, it's this is very handy for photogrammetry. Um, Megascans has been doing this very well. Um, it's awesome to get those really gnarly details like pebbles and rocks and stuff with cool overhangs and things that you couldn't really do before. Um, so now it, it, it's nice to not have to worry about that anymore. Um, purely for a virtual production and when you're cinematics based approach for games that's a different thing totally different topic um but yeah for when you're just trying to make cinematics and nice looking images it's it's really exciting to see where that's going awesome <clears throat> yeah yeah I, th I think when i downloaded the valley of the ancients demo i suddenly realized that okay so all the mesh you put all the mesh in there now that's great yeah. but now you've basically offloaded that problem to the hard drive and yeah exactly <clears throat> that so, so where you might optimize for memory, now you're optimizing for disk space and yeah. bandwidth as opposed to, so it's, a, it's still a consideration. It is. Not, not shoving every single polygon that you could into the engine. So you said like, if you have to process it then effectively you're kind of like rendering again, any time where I start feeling like I'm rendering in real time, yeah. whether it's light baking or it's a processing or whatever it is, I'm like not, not using this engine in the way that yeah. I'm, I want to, and and I was trying to get back to being able to use it quickly and rapidly and iterate fast yep. with it. And so it's like, and Unreal and Nanite doesn't even support displacement at all right now. So it's it's not even a consideration. So we, we it's actually not possible in its current state. So hopefully that changes. I really hope that they push for uh, making displacement more viable in the future. Um, but time will tell. So you got to work with what you got and yeah. you, you win some, you lose some, and you, there's no perfect platform yet. I think you, like you said, yeah. um, we're kind of taking, we're kind of offloading the problems, um, you know, to something else. So it's, yeah, I think it just makes it more fun for the artists because we don't need to spend as much time doing retopo and baking and everything. So that's cool. Um, yeah. but even then I still think we're still going to be needing to do some, a bit of retopo a little bit, uh, especially for, for, 
for uh, like dynamic assets. Assets that move. That's not what Nanite is for. Nanite is for purely static objects. So yeah. it's uh, yeah. We'll we'll see how things go. It's still pretty new tech. So I hope that they you know develop it more. So we'll see how it uh, how it is. I'm sure they will. And it's incredible. You know, I, I think it's see, seeing that demo, seeing the, the previous de uh, demo, the Matrix demo after mm -hmm. that as well. It's unbelievable that you can get all of that. That would have been a struggle to get that much geometry, even in a renderer at the beginning oh, sure. of my career. Like we would have <clears throat> not considered doing that even offline just because the farm like, wouldn't have had it. And Arnold would just like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go get lunch now. Uh, yeah. It's uh, even like pop it on the farm and like, all right, we'll be, we'll see it in, in an hour. But now it's just like, the cool thing is that there's no sample noise, right? It's all right. like, you know, I mean, we're used to turning down the sample, getting a, a render out just to kind of get an idea of what the render is going to look like. But now there's, there's just no real sampling noise anymore. It's just clean renders. So it's, uh, it's very unsettling almost sometimes where like things are just <laughs> so different. I'm like, what? It's just it's weird. So yeah. It's cool. It's exciting. I'm, I, to your point as well, I'm very excited to be at this at this moment in history because there's so much going on. There's so much innovation. So many new people coming in as well from yeah. different industries that haven't experienced this before. Yeah, um, definitely. yeah. I I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about your thoughts on. Um, Virtual production, you know, it, it's a, a massive umbrella term, but as people are <laughs> describing it for almost everything in production and post and pre and um, how have you seen the Unreal 5 come in and change the world of filmmaking and visual effects? I mean, now that we've got like it, the fact that we can get a much better, higher fidelity render quicker. Now with Lumen, we don't even need to consider baked lighting anymore, which is awesome because baked lighting is the worst it's like no one likes authoring light map uvs and that sort of thing so it just makes us spend less time on the technical nitty-gritty stuff that no one likes that we just offload to the juniors to like here you, you do this um but now we can actually focus on the art and make things look like i said it's not an arnold replacement or it's not an offline renderer replacement but it's close enough at some in for many of the shots so that makes filmmaking a lot easier it makes previs a lot easier i think i really see ue5 being used a lot for previs um just because of how it helps the director get a better well a, a better visualization of you know depth of field and motion blur and you know lighting in general because when you're used to seeing like play blasts from maya they're very misleading because you know you could think yeah this looks fine in, in a play blast and then you render it out and like oh you know what no this is not what i had in mind and so it just you got to go back to square one but now it's just it's good enough and you're like yeah okay this is good. it's close enough to the point where it's like yeah okay now we can just now we can render it and see how it looks uh so there's there's um that's one usage and then you know of course in the whole lead volume thing uh which i've worked with a little bit but not very much so i'm that that i really want to jump more into that i want to do more green screen stuff uh moving forward because i think that was one of the questions like uh if i experiment with green screen and lead walls and honestly not really not yet and i want to do more of it i have done it in the past but it's you know there's so much to do now so yeah yeah there is too much <laughs> just catching up when you kind of need to specialize a little bit like i've always prided myself in being a bit of a generalist like that's kind of how i've gotten all my jobs just because i'm able to handle a broad variety of problems and you know i mean if you know for example especially in smaller studios if you work in a smaller shop you're kind of de facto going to be a generalist because you have some shoes to fill in someone is sick one day or some kid someone's uh, had to go pick up his kid at kindergarten or whatever and like oh well i guess i have to do anim today um, and or tomorrow I'll have to do some lighting or look dev or whatever. So it, it, it's good to uh, to be a generalist, but it's really hard to be really good nowadays at a whole bunch of things. So it's easier to specialize a little bit um, and have a good understanding of how everything works, but still having some fortes. Right. I don't really know where yeah. I'm going, but yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, I like it anyway. It's, I think I said say the same thing often to people asked, asking about getting into the industry. Um, well, first it'd be like which industry? Um, if you're getting into film, then still certainly specialising is, is important because they mostly take specialists. Although some generalism is is slowly growing in the film world, yep. uh, but I think virtual production uh, is much more suited to the generalist and having having specialists in virtual production is actually not as great you know having people who can jump around and do different things because it, it's it's certainly it's it's wound visual effects back to the kind of beginnings i think into, it feels much more like a pirate ship again where people are figuring things out and having having yeah having those generalist skills there to be able to to dip into i think is really important yeah, I mean it's it's such it's a wild west right now. Like I think no one really knows what they're doing. Like every every single studio who who has who works with lead volumes or green screen, they all have their individual workflows and approaches to things because nothing is really standardized yet. Like I know I've you know I'm on a few uh, virtual production groups and people are asking me, oh like which LED screen should we buy? And honestly, like no one really knows. It's all like, oh, this has worked for us, that didn't work for us, but that was, you know, it depends on the combination. There's so many factors between like the camera that you're using to what your what your end goal is, like what your budget is, right? Because some are more expensive than others and some of the cheaper LED volumes are, well, they don't play nicely with certain cameras. So it's, it's there's there's no, easy answer when someone asks that question like oh like what should we get and how do we get started like honestly <laughs> good luck figure it out so uh because there's no bible for it yet there's no it's not really established um it's people everyone's figuring it out i think is it ilm who's kind of making they used to use unreal but now they're kind of using their own thing right yeah i i i'm not sure quite where they're at these days but i believe that they were getting back more into unreal again um because of the the, you know the talent well they use their own their own 3d software too when i worked right. there i had to learn it it was you know the xeno list their own 3 3d tool and yeah i then three days had to get productive in it and start pumping shots out it was quite difficult um and i think that also restricts the number of people that you can bring in and work on a on a piece as well i don't i don't know exactly where they are with that but they definitely were they used that i really believe um Mandalorian one and then switched yeah. to their own uh to Helios and I think they may be other using both now or or ch at least changing a little bit exactly it's, it's always a problem solving thing we're like okay you do a post-mortem at the end of a project like okay what went wrong what went right and then you kind of try to change it up for the next production and make things better and then like oh then you run into a whole new set of problems then you kind of back forth and go, go back and forth a lot and uh yeah, it's it's a a long process of trial and error. It's such new technology that yeah. it's going to take another few years before we really, um, you know, kind of iron out all these kinks and wrinkles and bumps in the road. Um, because it's it's, it's yeah, it, until someone actually standardizes the whole process, it's going to keep being kind of the wild west. It's not uh, going to change. So, uh, hopefully, UE five kind of helps with that, but we'll we'll see. That's, that's what I like about it too. The fact that it's so hasn't figured itself out yet. Because being in being in visual effects for me, I definitely had ups and downs in my career. And it was it was my hobby and my passion. I really wanted to get into. It. I dreamed of you know, Jurassic Park was what made me dream of wanting to work on the movies and on dinosaurs specifically. And it it was amazing getting in and then doing it really like working at it really really hard for a long time. I then fe I felt it. I felt the passion drain a little bit, and I probably I felt like I'd done a lot of things by that point. But yeah. I, I basically wasn't growing as much anymore, and that was partly my own fault of not mm -hmm. not pushing myself to grow. I got a little. I think I I burnt myself out a little bit too. But every kind of, every effect artist I know has done that <laughs> at some point, right? So. At least at least ten times. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Everybody's yeah. got that that uh, story. I think of. Like you were saying, you know, you like got it got a bit much, and we wanted to go traveling. I've done the same thing a couple of yeah. times as well. It's... And then we always come back. It's the Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. Like, oh, this 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 industry treated me terribly. Let's go back. <laughs> it's like any addict. <laughs> yeah, it is. So. But it's great. I love the I love the fact that now it's uh, there's so much 
enthusiasm and innovation going on. The fact that it's unknown is is challenging and also why it's great. It's, yeah. I think it's a really, really great time in history. Um, so some, somebody else asking about uh, Unreal 5, um, somebody saying, when is the best time to migrate your project to Unreal Engine 5? So yeah, so from say 426. So if you are working in 426 right now, you can migrate right away because that's going to be compatible. Um, the kind of like caveat here is if you're working in 427, you can't migrate uh, because 427, I don't think was ever supposed to happen. I think COVID delayed the release of UE5 and then to kind of smooth things out, 427 came out. Um, and so 426 can be migrated right away to UE5. That's not a problem. So just be aware if you already migrated to 427, you're going to have to wait until the actual official 5.0 release of UE5 to migrate 427 to UE5. So if you're in 426, you can go ahead and do it right now. That's fine. Awesome. And um, yeah, another question that came in was, um, how, did, how do you see AI affecting these, especially some AI tools in within Unreal or, or not? But, you know, yeah, AI in general is going to be an interesting one because A, I'm all for um, the automation of redundant tasks. So things like Roto. Like, I yeah. think it's awesome that if we can have some really good AI doing clean roto for us, I mean, that, I mean, just the removal of green screen stuff, that's going to be mwah, so good, so awesome. I totally encourage it. Um, and I think it's going to come sooner than later. I mean, we already have like yeah. AI upscaling software, like Gigapixel AI, and that's just insane. Um, I've absolutely up renders from 1080 to like 8K, and it held up really, really well. And yeah. like, <laughs> that's how that's black magic like it's insane so uh, i haven't tried the video one yet but i really want to try it and uh yeah. so we'll see how it goes but yeah oh the topaz yeah exactly that yeah. one yeah yeah so, they're, yeah their image based ones are incredible insane uh, so it's really cool to just like do a low res render a it's faster and even in even in real time like, because when you use the movie render queue sometimes it can be slow if you have like a slow gpu and stuff it's not real time when you render it through the movie render queue which is weird but yeah yeah it's um so yeah using the ai upscaling stuff is absolutely insane and now i think corridor crew made some like real time deep fakes as well which is just uh the future is terrifying really oh wow <laughs> what in, in unreal is that uh, like, I, don't like it? Unreal. I don't think so i haven't okay. finished the whole video but yeah that's uh but it will do real time based video. on video uh yeah so it's like uh this is scary, but okay. So, yeah, the, the future yeah. both amazing, exciting, and terrifying at the same time. Like, are we all going to lose <laughs> our jobs to AI? <laughs> so, guess we'll find out. Uh, I, we will. Yeah, no, no choice. <laughs> time keeps progressing. So, yeah, we'll. Um, I don't know if we had anything more. Oh, somebody's asking about the pros and cons of working remotely overseas. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so would I a well-established artist before moving to Norway? I mean, I had been working in games for six or seven years before moving to Norway. And so, like I said earlier, um, having this, I kind of got into the industry in, in VFX because of my Unreal knowledge. And so that was, that kind of really made things a lot easier to jump into. Um, pros and cons of working remotely overseas. Well, like I'm actually, well, now I wasn't working remotely until COVID happened because I was working in a studio here in Norway. And uh, so that was when COVID hit, uh, I think that was kind of an, an eye opener for a lot of studios, because at least in smaller countries like Norway, we have a hard time hiring really good seniors because no one wants to move to the snowy hellscape that is Norway, um, <laughs> right? Like it, it's cold up here. Like people would rather be by the beach in LA. Like I totally get that. Um, personally, I love the cold. I love snow. I love winter. I'm Canadian. So um yeah, so it, I think remote has made it easier for studios to hire talent abroad. It also makes it easier for students to live where they actually want to live because not everyone want, wants to live in L.A. Um, so, you know, it, I think it's opening a lot of doors. I think that there's, there's some challenges involved, of course, but most of those challenges re, uh, revolving around remote work are all communication based. So I think as long as you have good communication, it's pretty fine. So, yeah. So that's my take on it. I, I, I think it's awesome that we can live. We don't need to live in these like expensive cities now. We can just. I live in the middle of nowhere, like way out in the countryside, and it's 
it's great. It, it, it's nice to not have to pay the, the same cost of living as you do in a capital city. So it's, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of advantages to remote work. Well, may, may, uh, that, that answer is useful for me too. <clears throat> may find me uh, seeking somewhere else at some point. <laughs> yeah. LA is definitely pretty expensive. And, I, can uh, imagine. I can imagine. And crowded, <laughs> although I live, I live kind of on the edge of it, but um, okay. Yeah, no, it's it's great. I think for people to understand how you did it as well, the fact that you definitely didn't just go straight out no. into the wilderness. You started in um, by by the sounds of it anyway, honing yeah. your skills in a studio and then mm -hmm. being able to break out from there. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's pretty much it there. Great. Um, so yeah, before we wrap, we're going to come in towards the end of the podcast. Um, uh, I want to ask you where people can find out more about you. And I know that one great way to do it, as probably everyone's already aware, uh, is your amazing YouTube channel, which has helped me personally and a lot of other people out in the world. Um, uh, how, how did, how did you, well, I, we already talked about how you got into that, but, um, I guess you, can you say anything about your your plans for it? And you're just going to keep making amazing videos. And... I'm just that's the plan. I just gonna keep making content. I I enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun, and it's fun to tackle different challenges and different problems. And uh, yeah, like I it, I think it's a lot of fun. And so I'll be doing a lot more photogra photogrammetry stuff moving forward as well. And so I'm hoping to do more and more of it. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's. Uh, it's been more fun than I expected it to be. So I'm looking forward to doing more of that. So just more of that stuff coming. Same. Well, please, please do. Please do. We'll do. <laughs> we all appreciate it very much on behalf oh, of all so of much. our listeners. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, and I, lo I love the style and the, the care that you put into them. I think it's, it's exceptional. Um, so anywhere else that people can find out more about you? I know that you, um, you have your YouTube channel, you have yep. an art station. Yep. So yeah, YouTube, our station. I mean, I I have an Instagram as well, which I'm you know I don't post that much, at, but you know I'm there sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, definitely like YouTube, and com I try to get back to as many comments as I can in the videos. So when people have questions, I, I do try to get back to as many people as I can. But it's a full time job answering everyone. So unfortunately, yeah. if I don't get back to you, it's nothing personal. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but yeah, so YouTube is definitely my thing. Our station, Instagram are my main ones. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, and we also teach through the CG Spectrum. Correct, um, yep. And um, you've been good enough to be a guest of ours and once or twice. Thank you very much for that. Um, oh, yeah. Um, well, I could personally keep going all day. Sure. You know, this is this, this has been wonderful. I've really looked forward to this conversation and um, just wanted to thank you again, William, for being on with us today. It's been a, a real pleasure. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you also to our listeners. Thanks for joining us today from everybody out there on uh, seeing this live on Facebook and Twitch and to anyone listening on the podcast channels. Um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. If you want to find out more about what we're up to, we have a free Facebook group. It's Becoming a CG Pro on Facebook. Um, we also have our website if you're interested in, um, in any of our classes at www.becomecgpro.com. Um, we have some new courses coming up in Houdini and more in Unreal. Um, so check that out if you're interested. But yeah, thank you all for being here today. I appreciate it and look forward to another one in a couple of weeks. Uh, stay tuned and have a great day, everybody.